Welcome to episode 41. This is the ForensicWeek.com show, and I'm your host, Tom Moriello, coming to you from Laurel, Maryland, CEO of Forensic IQ Incorporated and professor at the University of Maryland Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice. Tonight, the art and science of fingerprint examination with guest Tim Ostendorp, who is the Chief of Security at Stevenson University in uh, Baltimore County, Maryland, and a retired Maryland State Police latent print examiner expert. Our intention this evening is to delve into the process of fingerprint examination and make it real. Identify its importance within the law enforcement community and learn about the day in the life of a fingerprint examiner. Ladies and gentlemen, ForensicWeek.com is a talk show that features real forensic science by real forensic scientists and investigators, real law enforcement officers, and real counterintelligence experts who find, collect, and examine forensic evidence in the performance of their duties. Broadcast live on your desktop every Thursday evening, 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, right here on www.forensicweek.com. We are a proud member of the Hangout10.com live TV webcast network, which is a series of shows recorded and broadcast live using Google+, a social networking service. Forensic IQ Update Report, presented live by my student interns from the University of Maryland. They report on abstracts that have been published in the Forensic IQ blog that keep you, keep you up on current issues, events, and training opportunities that are important in the forensic community. Student producers and interns with us this evening are the George Washington University, Laura Pachuki, uh, producer and co-producer from Stevenson University, Derek Wong. Now, I could tell you that two of my three interns from the University of Maryland are here, Alex Met uh, Metzel and uh, Carl Zenowitz. They both live in the same high-rise uh, uh, building, apartment building, next to the University of Maryland College Park. While we were preparing for the show, Fire alarm went off, and uh, um, Kyle, being uh, our Kip as he goes, being a fire uh, a volunteer fireman himself, he got the message on his uh, on his cell phone that the building was being evacuated. So um, hopefully there's no problem, and hopefully we'll uh, we'll see them uh, in a few moments. Before I introduce our guests, ladies and gentlemen, let's begin this evening's discussion. And and, be, and begin this evening's discussion. Let's hear from our producer in reference to how to contact us and ask questions. All right. Thank you, Tom. As always, if you have any questions or comments during or after the show, or if you have any suggestions about future shows, you can email us at forensicweek at gmail.com. If you have any questions for our guests or our interns during the live broadcast on YouTube, you can use the comment box below, and I'll bring that comment up during the show. Remember, if you like the show, please subscribe to our channel by clicking the subscribe button below. You can also find the ForensicWeek.com show on Facebook, where you can like and share our page. Back to you, Tom. Thank you, Derek. Uh, in two weeks, we will be having our anniversary show. It'll be one year in two weeks that uh, ForensicWeek.com has been uh, um, airing its show. And for that whole year, I've, I've been trying to find a fingerprint expert who uh, has the time and also would be able to talk to us on the show about the whole art and science of, of fingerprints. And thanks to Derek, uh, a graduate student from uh, Stevenson University, uh, he was able to uh, uh, make contact with and uh, have uh, Tim uh, Ozen, Ozen, Austin Darp, Austin Top. I'm going to say it right. I'm going to say it wrong a couple more times, Tim, and then I'll get it right. Okay. Tim Austin Darp. Uh, Tim is the chief of uh, security at uh, Stevenson University in Maryland, spent more than 20 years with the Baltimore County Police Department, 20 years as a police officer, and then uh, he went with the Maryland State Police as a latent print examiner that we'll be talking about this evening. He's a highly valued and respected member of Stevenson University's security team since 1990, and he is known for his level-headedness, he his integrity, and his unwavering professionalism. Uh, I assume, Tim, you gave us those words. Is that correct? Uh, yes. <laughs> or, or one of your parents, maybe. Yeah. Tim, thank you so much for being here. Welcome to ForensicWeek.com. Thank you for having me, Tom. 
Uh, and while uh, I was talking, I see that Alex and uh, Kip are back on the screen. So obviously, the building, uh, the view didn't burn down. Is that correct? Yeah. No okay. Explosions, nothing like that. Great. It. Great. Um, Tim, we were talking before the show started, and I said one of the most important things about the show is the topic, but just as much as the topic is the career field, because we have a lot of viewers who are watching this show because they're interested in the topic and they're interested in becoming an expert or, or a forensic scientist in the particular area. So it's interesting for me that you spent 20 years as a police officer, and then after that, you went in as a fingerprint expert. Tell us, tell us a little bit about your 20 years as a police officer and what caused you to move into the crime lab. Well, what started, Tom, I started as a uniformed police officer, as, as every officer does. And I had the opportunity, um, after several years on the street, to move into the crime lab as a crime scene technician, which to me is the, the best place to start if you're in, interested in the uh, forensic field at all. Because there, you really see where the evidence is recovered from, how it's recovered, and what value it plays in each individual investigation. Now, back then, Tim, I would assume that um, only police officers were evidence technicians back then. Isn't that correct? Well, primarily within our agency, as well as many within the state of Maryland, at that time, that was the case, but that right. has considerably changed. Yes, absolutely. It certainly has. Okay, so continue, please. So uh, starting at the crime scene, like I say, you really get it from the investigative side, working with the investigators, be it a burglary or a homicide, so to speak. So when you're recovering the, those hairs, those fibers, that fingerprint, um, that blood, you know, it, all that that you uh, recover, obviously, in the proper way to maintain its integrity, at some point in time is going to play a very integral part in that investigation and identifying a suspect. All right, so 20 years in law enforcement, why fingerprints? Well, actually, I didn't, I, that wasn't my first choice. Um, <laughs> okay. I, I enjoyed the crime scene, and I would have stayed in there, but I was presented with the opportunity by my supervisor at the time, another latent fingerprint expert, James Sims, who uh, came to me and offered me the opportunity to get trained in latent prints um, if I while so wish to do so. While you were a police officer? Yes. Um, after I'd been a crime scene tech for about 15 years, and I was then offered the opportunity to uh, become a latent print examiner, at which time I was enabled to uh, enter a training program with the Baltimore County Police Department uh, under the supervision of uh, two fingerprint uh, latent print examiner experts, and subsequently ended up where I uh, was with the state police as a latent print examiner. So I guess the transition from police officer to fingerprint examiner was a, was a natural thing for you. Well, at the time, it really was because I enjoyed the investigative side. So when we were looking at prints uh, and you uh, saw where the prints from, you could account for why they may be distorted, for example, or the uh, type of surface they came off of may have uh, an influence on the print. So being a crime scene technician uh, out there helped me uh, understand more when I looked at a latent print why it wasn't necessarily as pristine as you always see on television. Oh, that's right. And again, as I've t I mentioned to you also, uh, ForensicWeek.com is a anti-CSI show. So uh, uh, all we're interested here is reality and the truth. You know, uh, we named the show today the art and science of fingerprint examination. What I really wanted to name it was the art or science of fingerprint examination. Is fingerprint examination an art or a science or both? It's actually both, Tom. Okay, It is a scientific process that we do uh, when we uh, analyze these fingerprints, compare these fingerprints, and come to a conclusion. But it's also an art as to the comparison of the two. Um, obviously, in the past, there have been many challenges as to the scientific uh, reliability of the fingerprint science and fortunately it has survived those legal challenges so that we can still use fingerprints as a form of identification in the court system today. Okay, so it's both art and science. Tell our viewers, you know, everybody accepts the fact or uh, accepts the belief that no two people have the same fingerprints. Let me ask you, ha have you ever seen two uh, uh, a set of prints from two different people that were closely the, uh, similar? Well, uh, close and similar and identical are obviously different things, Tom. Um, when you look at fingerprints for patterns, for example, 60% of the population 
has loops. Um, 35% of the population has whirls, and then 5% of the population has arches. So yeah, 60% of the population has the same pattern, but in fact, they don't have identical fingerprints. Okay. What is it that makes a fingerprint unique? When we say, hey, your fingerprint is different than everyone else, what is it that you're looking at to establish uniqueness? Well, when you look at uniqueness in a print, for example, you go past the pattern. Uh, you look at what we call the minutia, and that's actually the characteristics within the fingerprint. And we have basic characteristics within the print. One would be, for example, what we call bifurcation. And that would be like the printed letter Y, Tom, where two ridges would branch into one or vice versa. We also have another characteristic with what we call an ending ridge. That would be where a fingerprint ridge would flow from a specific direction and simply stop. And the third characteristic we would have what we call a dot, and that would be simply a ridge with no direction. Now, we all have these three characteristics in our fingers and our palms and the toes and the bottom of our feet. But what makes you unique to you, with the exception of everybody else, is the, the relationship of these characteristics, excuse me, characteristics to each other as they're positioned on your fingers or your palms and the bottoms of your feet as well. So it's actually the positioning of all these unique characteristics that, you, that we can identify a specific individual with the exception of everyone else. Uh, for many years, uh, and I've been lecturing in this area for 36 years, I used to tell my students that um, you need anywhere from 6 to 12 points of identification before you can make an ID. And I used to go on and say, and, I don't, and if you would ask me where I heard this, I, I, I don't know, okay, that is it 6 or is it 8 or 10 or 12 depends on the jurisdiction. And that it was my understanding that the courts, the individual court would decide how many points would be required for you to establish identification. Is any of that make sense or true or was it true? Um, there, there was a time, Tom, where, um, for example, they had what they called the 12-point rule, where they uh, wanted 12 points of, of identification between a unknown print and a known print. Uh, in other countries, the number may even be higher than that. That's no longer the case at all when it comes to comparing fingerprints and the science of fingerprints as uh, requesting a specific number as a threshold before the examiner can determine if, in fact, it is an identification or not. So what you're saying is there is no specific standard in reference to the numbers. That's correct. So at what point can someone like you go into a courtroom and say that this latent print found on the gun belongs to the defendant to the exclusion of all others. When can you say that? Well, it's, it's, it's each individual examiner's opinion based on training, knowledge, and expertise. And when you examine these uh, latent prints to these um, known prints, you're looking at, you're not just looking at these points, you're looking at the uniqueness of these points or the shape of a particular ridge or a series of characteristics that's uh, clustered together that's unusual that you wouldn't normally see. So you're evaluating the whole print. You're looking at the uh, shapes of the ridges. You're looking at the individual characteristics as in relationship to each other when you're doing this comparison in order to come to your conclusion. Uh, rather, the examiner feels that this uh, either is an identification or they have excluded this person as being the source of the print, or the prints that they're examining, be it either the latent print or a known print, lack sufficient detail to be suitable for comparison purposes and come to a conclusion. Okay, good, good answer, great. Uh, Kip, I think you have a question. Yes, that's correct. Hello, everybody. Um, my question is, if you are a more experienced fingerprint examiner and you are involved in a case, uh, would you be able to say that there's a match based on points to less points than someone that doesn't have as much experience because the court would trust you more? Or is it is it all based on trust is what I'm wondering? Well, there's a process when you do this uh, comparison. Um, obviously, training, knowledge, and expertise plays into this, but when you come to a conclusion, be it for example, let's say we're coming to a conclusion of an identification. First of all, that expert or that individual latent print examiner has to be qualified as an expert 
in the eyes of the court before he can testify as to his findings. So all this would come into play when you go through the process to qualify yourself as an expert. How long have you been doing it? How many comparisons have you done? How many times have you testified? So it's up to the court first after hearing uh, you testify as to your training, knowledge, expertise, and experience as to if they feel you are qualified to te testify as an expert in the field of fingerprint identification. Uh, Tim, you mentioned training. Uh, is there a, uh, a standard for training for before somebody can testify in a court of law in reference to fingerprints? Um, today there is. There, uh, there are certain protocols, training period, uh, uh, how long, um, what, what classes you must take and so forth in order to um, be qualified through your individual agency and right now they were more of establishing a uh, national standard, so to speak, that so regardless of whether you work for Baltimore County or you work for the Minnesota State Police, they want everybody to have the same standards as for the training required in order to be qualified as a fingerprint expert. Now, uh, IAI, the International Association of Identification, are you, uh, do you happen to be a member of that organization? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, they have a certification for a lot of different um, career fields. They have one for fingerprints, do they not? Yes, sir, they do. And is um, are they looking at their certification as a possible national standard? Well, that's part of the whole process. And, and, and of course, um, the International Association of Identification has very high standards. Um, the reputation of the organization, uh, they're very concerned about. So they make sure that they meet all the other guidelines of other agencies as well in requiring that uh, what process an individual latent print examiner must go through in order to be certified. Yeah, good. And, and, to, and to our students out there, you know, professional organizations are vital to the success uh, of any profession. And, uh, for example, the American Polygraph Association, they have established the training standards and the program standards that the, that the federal government has adopted uh, and uh, most law enforcement agencies uh, can adopt. So that way, you know, every police department can have their own standards, but if they have some place to go, uh, so they don't have they don't have any problems in court, because it's all about can you get your person to be certified as an expert in the in the courtroom. Now, let me ask you um, if if you if you are if you've examined some fingerprints and you're working for the for the state, you know you're presenting it, and I'm working for the and I'm working for the defense because that's what I do now that I'm retired, you know, and uh, I find myself an expert who is going to argue that, you know, you found uh, uh, eight points of identification or ten points, and uh, that uh, you know that isn't enough that there are standards around the world that require more. Will that put doubt in the minds of the jurors? Well, obviously, Tom, the, the defense, you know, it certainly has their right to hire any expert to counter any testimony by the state, okay? And, and if you would put any doubt in the juror's mind, obviously that has an influence on their decision. Mm -hmm. um, but if you adhere to the science of fingerprints, you go by the correct procedures when analyzing and comparing that fingerprint to come to your conclusion and you go through the necessary verification process, um, it's going to be more difficult for that expert to challenge what your conclusion was. Okay. All right. Let me ask I another question. question. I'm sorry. Was there a question? Yeah. I yeah. Go question. ahead. Go ahead, Derek. So, um, Tim, are there any, like, uh, technical reviews? Like, for, for instance, I know the biology unit um, has... Uh, examiners check each other's work. Is that the case also for the fingerprint examiners? Yes, uh, Derek. In the case of um, uh, fingerprint identification, before you can report out what your findings were in the case of a positive identification, you are saying that the unknown print from the glass, for example, positively belonged to the uh, right thumb of a particular individual. Before you can report that out, you must then give that to another examiner for them to re-examine to see if they in fact do come to the same conclusion. I see. So that that actually strengthens your testimony in court, right? Well, it, you're still testifying to the same thing, but what you've done is you've adhered to the proper protocols 
to have that print, in fact, examined by a second examiner to verify that your results were correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's say, so that's, and that's a quality control program. Um, all right, so you have a good quality control program. Several, uh, you know, the examiner did the, the examination, came up with, a ma uh, with an identification, quality control agreed, you testify in court, defense goes and finds themselves an examiner who disagrees and says that's not correct for whatever reasons. Does it, it ultimately at that point becomes which one the jury wants to believe? Which, is that a correct statement, uh, Tim? Uh, I guess that's that's somewhat correct. Uh, somewhat correct. Obviously, if the uh, defense expert has uh, substantial credibility as far as an expert witness, the jury is going to take into into account what that individual says as well. Good. You know, in 1984, DNA significantly changed how we approach a crime scene and, and, and conduct investigations. Uh, for many years, people always assumed, this is before APHIS now, the Amer uh, Automated Fingerprint Identification System, people assumed that if you found a fingerprint at a crime scene, if that person had ever been fingerprinted for any reason, uh, that it was, it was in that file system in the sky somewhere, and that you'd be able to find that person. Now, that just wasn't reality back then. Could you tell us a little bit about how it was and then how APHIS has significantly changed how valuable fingerprints have has become? Certainly. Prior to APHIS, as you said, the automated fingerprint identification system, if a fingerprint would be recovered from a crime scene, and let's just say it was a, uh, a very pristine print, um, uh, a lot of characteristics in there, Unless the investigators develop the name of a suspect or a person that they believe may have been there, and you went and got the fingerprint records of those individuals, you would have to do a comparison between the print from the crime scene to all those individuals to see if you could, in fact, affect an identification for that print. Now, the person who that print did, in fact, uh, belong to could have 10 fingerprint records in there in Maryland, Pennsylvania, who knows where, but unless you had a name of an individual to pull those records, uh, there was no other way to do that other than by manual comparison by retrieving the fingerprint records of a suspect and comparing them. So if you had no suspect to compare them, they kind of just sat in the, in the investigative file? That's correct. And if at some point in time they identified a suspect by other means, then you could use it as a comp uh, you know, to, you know, to co uh, corroborate other evidence. Correct. Okay. All right. So then all of a sudden, the AFIS, now, a automation came a long time ago, but it took a while before AFIS, as we know it today, to really make a difference. Tell us how AFIS, the Automated Fingerprint Identification System, has made a difference in the investigative process. Well, for those people that, that don't understand, Tom, what APHIS is, is a system, a data system, that scans the fingerprints of individuals that may, in fact, have an arrest record or individuals that may, in fact, have a fingerprint record because they've apl applied for a specific license or a handgun permit. So the data that's in APHIS is not necessarily only those of criminals. The fingerprint data could be those of non-criminals where the state statutes require those individuals to be fingerprinted so that a background check can be conducted before they may get a particular license. And what the automated system does is it scans each individual finger. And in today's system, it doesn't only scan the fingers, it scans the palms as well. And Are they doing the palms also? Yes, sir. The, the latest version of APHIS also records palms, and it also records, Tom, the second and the third joint of the fingers as well. So but that would, that would be all... The entire finger and the palms. That would only be a, if the investigators or the evidence technicians did a set of major case prints, right? That's correct, because not all agencies, as a matter of policy, require palm prints to be taken of individuals. Yeah, and for the uh, again, for the uh, audience, uh, major case prints are a... A, um, a copy of all the ridges on the palms and all the fingers, including the tops of the fingers where there's ridges also. And the, uh, the t normally that is done when uh, 
Leighton prints have been found at a crime scene, a major crime scene, uh, and you have the you have a suspect or a defendant, and you want to make sure you have all the uh, the ridge detail of the person. That's correct. But so, that's great. I didn't know that they they collected them. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. So and it rec but when um and when it rec scans these fingerprints, it records the location of all the minutia on each one of those fingers and those palms. For example those bifurcations, those dots and those ending ridges. It records the location on every single finger and palm. Okay, so you may, for example, Tom, you could have uh, uh, 75 or 100 points of minutia on a thumb, for example. And, you know, uh, you could have thousands on a palm uh, of this minutia. And when you take, so now you have all this data in the system uh, associated with each individual person. and and also what they do now with the new APHIS, Tom, is, for example, if you have 10 fingerprint cards of one individual in there, they scan all 10 fingerprint cards and put those in their database because there may be a particular area on one fingerprint card that wasn't recorded on another fingerprint card as far as the minutiae is concerned. So they try to collect as much data as possible off of each individual when they scan these fingers. Is it correct to say that APHIS no longer concerns itself with the class characteristics of the fingers? You know, uh, they're not, it's not looking at whether it's a loop or a whirl. They're just focused on the minutia. Is that correct? Well, you still can use that as a descriptor if you want to, for example. So if you have a system that's recording not only the minutia but the fingerprint patterns, and you have an unknown print, for example, that is clearly a whirl, and you put that print into the system and you tell the system it is a whirl, then what you've done is you've narrowed your search base down by eliminating the other two fingerprint patterns. So if, you, if you're telling the system to search whirls, you've eliminated all the loops and you've eliminated the arches as well. So the more specific you can get on the search, the better your results can be. Great. Now before APHIS, um, when we did uh, background investigation checks, especially you know in the federal government, uh, we'd take a set of prints, we would submit it to the FBI, they'd do their check, and then they would return the cards back to us because they didn't want them. Um, uh, since APHIS, are they now scanning them and then keeping them into the system? Yeah, what we do is, Tom, when I say we, when I say police agencies, they now have what they call live scan. There's no longer the ink process. Oh, yes. They roll those fingers on a clear glass plat okay, until they get the appropriate set of fingerprints, uh, apply the data that's associated with that, name, uh, date of birth, height, weight, uh, sex, so forth. Then electronically, that data is sent into the database, and they still maintain a hard copy of the card on file. Because when you actually affect an identification, if in fact the, the suspect was developed through APHIS, you're not reporting the identification out simply by looking at the two images on the screen. You actually get the card that generated that image so that you can make sure that that image on that card is associated with the correct card and the correct person. So a very important point that you made, and I want to make it clear to, to our viewers, is that even today, um, in 2013, uh, the computer is not making the final identification. The examiner is still making physically takes, ultimately takes the hard copy and then finally makes the final identification. Is that correct? That's correct. When that, before that identification is determined, or non-identification in the case, it could be an elimination as well, that examiner is actually getting that original latent print and getting a copy of that individual's known uh, scanned fingerprints and doing the comparison there to make the determination. They're not simply basing it off what they see on the screen. Okay, so... Uh, go ahead. Um, so how does the APHIS database work in terms of cold cases? Well, as Tom spoke earlier, if you had a print from a case and the, and the investigators never developed the suspect, it just laid in the file indefinitely. Now you have the capabilities, regardless how old the case is, for example, to take that print out, scan that print, have the computer record the location of the minutia, do a search through the automated system. It will then generate a list of candidates that print may or may not belong to based on the location of the fingerprint minutia. And then you would go down and get a copy of those individuals' fingerprint cards and then do an actual manual comparison between the latent print and the known prints that this, of the individuals that the uh, APHIS generated for you. 
Okay, so in your experience, have has APHIS been very helpful in solving cold cases? Oh, absolutely. It, it's been it's probably been the greatest tool as far as latent print examination that they've ever had as far as clearing cold cases that you wow. didn't have suspects on. APHIS and DNA has significantly changed how criminals commit crimes and how investigators conduct the investigations, without question. Um, Laura? Um, Tim, do you think that the development of APHIS has helped or hindered the identification process of fingerprints? Obviously, it shoots out um, different, you know, based on the minutia, it will give you um, different suspects for the fingerprint match, but do you think that it's kind of hindering the person's job and making them think, oh, this is definitely a match, and then they don't really follow up with what they're supposed to do in the identification process? Well, I think in some cases it may make the investigators lazy, thinking that they'll just count on okay. APHIS to, to clear the case for them and to develop a suspect. Right. There mm -hmm. are, you may have a print of a suspect, and that person may have 10 prints in APHIS, and it doesn't guarantee that APHIS is going to find that print. So we always instruct investigators, even though we have APHIS available to do our searches, if you have a suspect, still submit them. Yeah. And again, APHIS does, really doesn't hinder the examiner. Actually, what APHIS has done, unlike a lot of computers, it's created work. Okay, so now it's given you more people to look at on a particular case than you had before. And we're still, as Tom said, we don't rely on the APHIS system to say the print does or does not belong to you. We simply rely on that system strictly based on fingerprint minutia to provide a list of candidates that then the examiner can look at and come to a conclusion one way or the other. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Alex, you had a question? Yeah. Um, a couple of minutes ago, you guys were making the point that in the end, people are still the ones who are making the identification, not the computer. Um, I was curious, do you think in the future there will be some kind of technology where the computer, like on all the CSI TV shows, where the computer like positively identifies this is the person and there aren't people looking at digging out fingerprint cards and making the identification? Well, let me make something clear when it comes to APHIS, okay? When it comes to APHIS and latent prints, APHIS is not making the identification when it's comparing latent prints to a known individual, it's an examiner that's making that determination. The computer does make identifications, for example, when you have all ten fingers to work with. When you're, uh, for example, uh, taking the fingerprints of people coming into this country um, to verify, in fact, uh, that they you know, have their visas and they're not wanted or they're not on a known terrorist list, is those fingerprint searches are actually done by the computer, but they're looking at a lot more than a, a very fragmentary uh, latent print. Latent prints tend to only be about 25% of the actual fingerprint. So you're dealing with a smaller portion uh, of a print when you're comparing latents to ink prints, or excuse me, uh, uh, or scan prints. When you're comparing scan print to scan print, all 10 digits, there's more information there that the computer has gets to a certain threshold where the computer is going to make the determination that the print card uh, from specimen A and the print card from specimen B is in fact the same individual based on a 10 print fingerprint search. So the computer does make identifications uh, when it comes to 10 print searches. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, and let me just say, Alex, when, when you asked that question, what I thought about was the, Red, uh, the World Series games. When I was watching my Red Sox win the World Series this year. What was most aggravating to me is to watch this, the technology they were using. Uh, the umpire, uh, umpire would make a call and then the TV would show whether they made the right call or not. Because we now have technology that, to show whether it's a ball or a strike. So constantly We'd sit there, watch him make a, a call, and then the, the technology would say it was wrong. So when are we going to get rid of the umpires? We don't need them behind the plate. Now, some people say, oh, no, that's not baseball. Well, i got to tell you, when science gets that good, why should we use an umpire who 
you know, who's human and, uh, you know, and can't always make the right call every time if we have technology. So I would say in the future, who knows? And as Tim said, we're kind of doing that in some sense. In the criminal cases, though, we still need that last person. Uh, I'm looking at the clock, and um, what I'd like to do right now is give Tim a little rest. And uh, I want to remind everybody that they're watching uh, ForensicWeek.com. That's www.ForensicWeek.com. And our topic this evening is fingerprints and fingerprint examination. Um, what I'd like to do now is call upon our interns to give our Forensic IQ uh, update. I'll start with uh, Alex, uh, and then we'll go to Kip. Uh, unfortunately, Emily uh, is not with us this evening. She wasn't feeling well. So, uh, And then when we come back, Tim, what we need to do, and I'm going to have it ready, we have to talk about the Mayfield case that has not only had us re-examine fingerprints, but it has made us re-examine the whole forensic uh, community. So I'm going to bring up those um, some of those slides that I have, and I'd like to talk a little bit about that, if that's okay with you. Sure. Okay, great. Alex, take it away. All right, thanks, Tom. Um, so the first article that I looked at this week was on ForensicMagazine.com by John Barbara. And um, it was about seizing digital evidence, so kind of reflecting on our show from last week. Um, he just gave some Tim's tips and kind of pointed out some difficulties when you have a warrant to seize a computer or something. Um, he explained that digital evidence collection is unique and different than collecting physical evidence from a crime scene. He explained that a lot of people think that executing a war in 10 days means that the computer evidence has to be processed within 10 days, where that's not the case the uh, warrant simply just has to be served in that time. Um, he also explained that sometimes it's good to get an extra warrant um, that explains exactly what files will be taken from the computer after you've actually seized it. And he goes on to explain some other things. So if you're interested in digital evidence, it'd be good to check out that article. Because he gives good. you one Very good. Um, the Very other good article job. I looked at was just um, a website, ForensicFocus.com, that has a bunch of computer forensic-related webinars on it. Um, they're about 30 minutes in length, so they're definitely easy to fit into your day. Some are 18, some are 60 minutes, but for the most part, they're pretty short. Um, some of the webinars they offer include Finding Evidence in an Online World, Trends and Challenges in Digital Forensics, Mobile Forensics, MP and Android Malware Detection, and some pitfalls of interpreting forensic artifacts in Windows Registry. Fantastic. So the, you law enforcement officers out there, again, I keep saying this, no more complaints that you, uh, that you can't get the training. There's plenty out there, and if you listen to ForensicWeek.com every week, you'll learn about them, or go on Forensic IQ Inc. Uh, uh, website, uh, our blog, we try to keep as much uh, knowledge of the training uh, in the blog, so you can always go there. Okay. Uh, did you have any more, Alex? Nope. Just those two. Okay. Good. Kip, thank you. Yep. Oh, are you good evening, everybody? Once again, um, my first article is set in Australia, where uh, work on a $106 million building for the Australian Federal Police has uh, gone into effect for a new cybercrime building. Um, while its main idea is to go through cybercrime and to fight it there, um, the building also has the ability to examine crime scene investigating, firearms, fingerprints, criminalistics, and identification sciences. Um, the new building is built after there was a cyber attack on their public, on the front, I'm sorry, the Australian Federal Police's public website, and uh, funnily enough, they began to build this building right away afterwards. So, Kip, are you saying that the, the, the thought of building the building in, in this program came after they got attacked? From what I read on the article, it seemed as though the building is in re, uh, response to the attack on the website. However, it seemed as though that the timing just seemed to be perfectly timed out where the building just happened to begin right on the uh, date of the attack. That's not unusual to happen at all. Okay, great. <laughs> Next one. And in my second article, um, author uh, Warrington goes through uh, how to 
create a online, uh, not an online, but a checklist and check sheet to go through a death scene. Now, this death scene checklist uh, can be used for court trials and just overall investigating of a scene of death. Um, the uh, investigators sometimes forget what they had done on the scene. Um, and this checklist is an easy way to go through and find out uh, other options and to remember what you went through. Uh, along with the information provided, there are links to, that lead to webinars from Warrington on how to use that scene checklists on the website, and those are posted under my article and uh, are free to view. Thank you. Thank you, Kip. Let me just mention to our viewers about checklists. As Kip said, checklists are great, but if you're a law enforcement agency um, and you're going to use a checklist, you need to look at the other resources. For example, if it's a checklist for death investigation, you need to go talk to your medical examiner's office and make sure that your checklist is correct and it's not missing anything. You need to check all the different uh, areas. Check the uh, EMTs, the ambulance services. Is there, a, is there something that they need uh, that should be added there? Because that checklist will be looked at in the courtroom. Because when I'm working for the defense, the first thing I ask is find out what the investigators did to decide what steps they took at the crime scene. Uh, do they have training? Do they have a checklist? Do they have a regular? Do they have a standard operating procedure? What is that standard operating procedure? Because I'm going to look at it against national standards and see if there's anything missing in in their uh, standards because that's the way the system is. So be aware of that. Kip, thank you. I want to get back to our guest. Um, I want to thank uh, both, uh, both my interns. Um, this is an exciting week for, uh, for Kip uh, and Alex and uh, Emily. We're very close to finishing our mock crime scene uh, facility uh, at the University of Maryland College Park. Uh, we have an office scene that's the scene of a murderer. We, we have a bedroom scene, which is the scene of a rape. And now we have a vehicle that uh, has been donated to us, and we're, tomorrow we're going to tow it into position right next to our building. Uh, that is going to be part of the overall uh, process. So they've been working hard, creating scenarios, collecting uh, evidence, and collecting articles to make these three scenes uh, are real. Thank you very much. Tim, let's get back. Uh, as I mentioned to you um, before we took a little break there, that I wanted to come back and talk about the Mayfield case. Um, and I have a slide up here, and I'm assuming, uh, Derek, that you've got that slide up right now because I can't see you. Yep. Uh, okay. Um, Madrid commuter train terrorist bombing happened in March 11, 2004. There was a latent print found on a detonator bag. Uh, Spanish police sent a copy of that latent print to the FBI and said, hey, can you do us a favor? Can you see if this, uh, the owner of this latent print is in your APHIS dat uh, database? Um, they checked it out. APHIS said no. They asked a different question. They said, uh, okay, then tell, give us your, your top 20 closest prints. And when they did that, on, on November, on May 6, 2004, the FBI arrested one of those 20 people, uh, Brandon Mayfield, based on the fact that they said they had up to 15 points of identification that belonged uh, to him in association to this latent print. At the time, he was a Nebraska lawyer married to an Egyptian immigrant, Muslim convert. He was representing Muslim uh, clients. And um, I'm not sure whether they stopped looking at the fingerprint and started profiling him. And before you know it, he was arrested and was convinced that um, the prints were a match. Uh, on May 19th, Spanish police said, uh, never mind, we, we have the right person. Uh, those weren't his prints. I'm going to put... Uh, that latent print up here, Tim, and can you tell us a little bit about what we have here 
and uh, then I'll bring then I'll bring up uh, um, Mayfield's print. Maybe you can explain to us a little bit about the similarities and differences. Well, I'll be honest. I've never looked at this print before, Tom. Okay, and so I'm just looking at it on the screen here. Um, um, as we well know, and as, as you certainly know, as a uh, 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 working for the defense, that this was an erroneous identification. Okay, that the source of this fingerprint wasn't, in fact, um, the gentleman here in the United States. The source of this print was, in fact, somebody uh, of interest who was identified uh, directly associated with the bombing. Okay, um, I hate to say this, but you know, sometimes some good things come out of some bad things. And in this particular case, as a result of this um, uh, misidentification, a lot of protocols have since been changed when looking at a single print identification in a case uh, to a particular individual when you come to the conclusion that uh, this print uh, is in fact uh, was from this individual. So uh, as a result of this, some good things did come out of it. If this wasn't such a high profile case, uh, and again, we're not throwing stones here, we're trying to learn from this as you just said. Um, should this print have, is the quality of this print good enough to, to even do an analysis? Well, certainly you can see ridge flow on both the prints, Tom. Um, you can clearly see that uh, uh, looking at the prints that it's either a, uh, it could either be determined as an arch or a short count loop. So when you're looking at uh, different levels of detail, uh, the first thing you're looking for is specifically is ridge flow. And in this particular case, you can see that you do have the, the same ridge flow. Um, and you're using this part as your of your analysis process, rather to uh, if there's something there, rather to continue this examination. So obviously, um, from what I can see, looking at the print from the detonator bag and the print depicted in Figure 6A, they do in fact have the same ridge flow. Okay. So this next slide, the first fingerprint is Mayfield's. The, the second one is the latent print, and the third one was the actual defendant uh, suspect who ultimately, I believe, was convicted. Um, um, so looking at th these, um, you know, for example, over here I see an island uh, in Dowd's print here, number six. I think it's the same as six over here. Six looks like a, a fragment or a dot versus uh, an island. Would you agree to that? Yeah, and when you and and as I mentioned before, Tom, a lot of times you have to look at the substrate that the latent print that was was recovered from, because this could have an effect on uh, why a particular characteristic would appear that it's the way it does, or be distorted to the point that it is. And when an examination is conducted, obviously the examiner has to be able to articulate as to why one characteristic doesn't look exactly like the other characteristic. Would you say that the problem Mayfield had was that he had minutiae in the general same areas uh, as um, the latent print? Or at least they identified in the latent print minutiae. For example, the number six in the latent, you know, they assumed that was a, a dot, yet we can see over here that it's actually in, in enclosure. Uh, but they, there certainly are things, are minutia in s the same general locations as Mayfield, and that was pro that's probably what brought APHIS to Mayfield in the first place. Would you agree? Well, absolutely. I mean, APHIS is based on the characteristics and the location of those characteristics in relationship to each other. So um, the system uh, is going to provide a list of candidates where those locations of those characteristics Ristics are either exactly or very close to those of your print that you put in the system. You know, uh, you know, we talk about human beings ultimately making the decisions. In that, as human beings, we have frailties that we ha that we deal with every day. Um, and uh, not only did the examiner, and I think there was a lot of pressure to try to make a case, help make the case, and a lot of pressure from the quality control process because. And it would 
decide, you know, if I if I make an identification and I hand it to you and say, hey, Tim, I just made this identification, but this is a high-profile case. I need you to look at it also. I kind of told you it was a match, <laughs> you know. Well, you, you did two things, okay? One, you already told me this is a high-profile case. Right. So, Right away, you're thinking, okay, this is this is uh, this is serious, more serious than the kid that broke into your shed. Um, secondly, you're telling me, listen, take a look at this, but I already know it's him in a way. Uh -huh. So as a result of this, the protocols have changed, and this is just me personally. I never, I never wanted the the, the investigator to say to me, hey, this is my this is my suspects, and this is my best guy. It doesn't make any difference to me. I didn't want him to say. Listen, this is really important. We got a lot of pressure uh, to clear this case. You know, lots going on here. I don't. I don't want to hear that. I intentionally avoided that because if I am going to stay true to the science, I am going to be based my decision, whether it's an identification or non-identification, to the specimens that I'm comparing, regardless of who the suspect is, the high-profile case, uh, pressures on 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 us to affect an identification. Um, that's not included in the process if you're doing the process correctly. I'm simply comparing an unknown to a known and coming to a conclusion strictly based on those two items, not what you have told me as an investigator or my boss has told me as a high-profile case. If you truly do that, then you haven't biased yourself prior to doing that comparison. Great. And bias, bias is something you got to really watch for. All right. Let's start talking a little bit about the career because this is what's really important for many of my uh, my viewers. Uh, I want to give them some reality of the job. You know, again, TV makes you believe that you got a latent print, you got um, uh, you got APHIS. Uh, all you have to do is run it in the APHIS, and if the person's ever been arrested, uh, APHIS is going to find it. Uh, that's not realistic. Let me ask you, what percentage of all the cases, you were doing this eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, for how long? Uh, 1985 till 2009. Okay. During that period of time, if you had a guess, what percentage of, of time did you, or what percentage of cases were you able to make an identification where it was the smoking gun in the case? Um, I couldn't give you an exact number, Tom. Okay, it, um, were there cases where there were only fingerprint evidence? Sure, but there was cases as well where there was fingerprint evidence applied with trace evidence applied with DNA evidence, and all of that plays a part in it. But to absolutely say how many cases or what amount of time my identifications were the sole source of a suspect, I really couldn't tell you. Okay, all right. Um, I have students, you know, we have about uh, 800 undergraduate criminal justice majors, and, and some of them take my course and they say, hey, I really like forensic science, but they don't have the science background to continue their education. For example, Derek is a former student of mine, but he was, he was taking my course, he was, a, he was both a criminal justice and biology major, uh, and that's why he's where he is now. But my criminal justice students, some of them don't want to be police officers. Some of them don't even know why they're criminal justice majors, okay? Uh, they say, well, I, I just like the subject. Okay, fine. Now, reality is you're getting ready to graduate. What are you going to do with it? They're saying, I don't know. I don't want to be a police officer, but I want to do something else. What about forensic science? Well, there's only so many things you can do. Fingerprint analysis is one of them. In fact, this past semester, including the, the original producer of this show, um, actually was hired by with a number of my students by the, by the DOD. Um, not No, not hired by DOD, hired by a DOD contractor to be trained as fingerprint examiners to work on DOD stuff. <laughs> okay, it's classified, and, they, and I don't even know what it is. But bottom line is they're excited. I've been talking to them. Of course, they can't talk. I would have loved to have them on the show uh, to talk with you and, and ask questions, but... Uh, that couldn't happen, but um, so for those people out there who don't know what their major is, maybe it, they do have, they are a criminal justice major, or they're in high school, what do you suggest they should do to be where you are today? 
should they be a police officer first or what? Now, Tom, I think, first of all, let's start with the nuts and bolts. Let's get that college degree, okay, be it in science, biology, whatever the choice is. And then at that point, you really you want forensic science, but you're not quite sure what field, then that's when you want to be a crime scene tech, okay? All the police departments practically across the country have gone to civilian crime scene technicians, so you don't have to be a police officer. Uh, many of them have uh, on-the-job training, so you can start there right out of college. And it gives you a chance to recover all these items that will be used in different sciences, DNA, trace evidence, ballistics, fingerprints. And you can work with the experts in that field, and perhaps once you do that, that will help you decide if this is in fact what you want to do and narrow it down to what specific field you really want to do this in. But isn't it true now that evidence technicians, if, if, the, if the degree is required and in, in, it normally is now, it has, they have to have physical science, it's biology, chemistry or something? Yes, normally it does, but there are some variables in there depending on the agency. So does a criminal justice major have the ability to be an evidence technician, in your opinion, based on yes. your experience? Yes, they do. They do. Okay. What about a fingerprint examiner? Um, again, um, that would de depend on what your protocols are for that particular agency as to what they require to uh, before you even enter their training process. Uh, for example, the FBI protocols for educational requirements for a fingerprint examiner may be different than those from the state police or the Baltimore City Police or whatever. So I think prior to um, uh, making up your mind what you want to do, you want to research a particular agency or a series of agencies to determine what, in fact, their requirements are before you even consider entering that particular field. I have students who graduate looking for a job, and they come to me concerned. Say, look, at every time I apply for a job, they say, sorry, you're not qualified. You don't have any experience. How am I going to get experience if they won't hire me? How do you respond to that? Uh, I, I wish I had the perfect answer for that, Tom. Uh, <laughs> that's when you got to go in and sell yourself and tell, you know what, I'm the best guy for the job even though I have no experience or best girl for the job. Um, it's, that, that's a tough bridge to, to get over. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of agencies still use that as a criteria. I'd have to say to them, just don't stop with that agency. Keep on knocking on doors. Keep on looking at those uh, different agencies until you find one that's going to say, okay, we're going to give you a chance. We're going to get you in here and give you some training. Tim, excellent advice. I'm glad that it's coming from you and not just from me be, uh, because you, you did it, you know, you um, and you got to where you wanted to go, and you've seen it, and uh, that's very helpful advice for, uh, for my viewers, and I appreciate that. And I also appreciate you uh, being on the show this evening. Uh, let me just give, uh, give them a couple of words before we, we kind of sign off. You know, this is a subject we could talk for, for hours and hours, but we try to keep the show uh, to one hour. Let me just tell our viewers, don't forget the, uh, the American Academy of Forensic Science webinar uh, schedule is still going on. Um, you know, don't forget to go to www.aafs.org webinar, um, webinars uh, next week, November 27th, from 7 to 9 Eastern Standard Time, will be digital in multimedia sciences. So uh, if you're interested in jobs in digital and multimedia uh, area, in the forensic areas, uh, then you need to do that. Uh, next week we have, I'll tell you, Stevenson University is well represented in ForensicWeek.com. Uh, next week, December 5th, we have Professor Coogan and Professor Colin May uh, uh, going to be uh, guests, and we're going to discuss fraud investigation and white-collar crime. Those are area, uh, topics that we have never discussed before, uh, and we look forward to doing that. December 12th, we have Professor T uh, Ted Robinson from GW University. He's a retired Arlington County police officer, and he's going to be talking about forensic photography, crime scene photography. Looking forward to that. On the 19th of December, uh, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Pod Podini. Did I pronounce that correctly, Laura? Podini. Okay, uh, that's good okay. enough. <laughs> discussing uh, DNA analysis in his uh, personal research on predicting biogeographic ancestry and trials. So that's pretty interesting. Next week, ladies and gentlemen, um, um, we, uh, we will not be here because it's uh, Thanksgiving time. 
uh, and we decided nobody would be wanting to see us live on Thursday evening, so we're giving everybody a rest. Um, I also want to mention that on November 24th at 6 p.m., uh, the documentary Lizzie Borden Had an Axe that Tom Lang and uh, from LAPD and I uh, did. Uh, I'll tell you, every time uh, uh, Destination America channel puts that on, uh, it has high uh, viewership. So on November 24th at 6 p.m. and then December 4th at 10 p.m. Uh, Tim, I want to thank you again uh, for being our guest. I hope that maybe you can come on in the future and uh, talk more about crime scene uh, investigation. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I know it's, uh, you've had a long day, and I appreciate you uh, coming. Tom, thanks for having me. Okay, and thanks to my student interns. Like always, ForensicWeek.com has been brought to you through the cooperation with the Hangout10.com live TV show network. We recommend that you go to Hangout10.com uh, website and see the schedule of other shows like this one available for you to learn and be entertained. Meanwhile, always tell your friends, colleagues to tune in and keep watching ForensicWeek.com live every Thursday evening, 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And also, don't forget to view all the 41 shows that are archived there on all the various subjects. We hope the content presented in this show, as well as the previous shows, um, opened your mind and curiosity to the wonders of forensic and criminal justice sciences. See you next time, and thank you for watching.